evening everyone it's Christine here so I'm gonna pop on and do a bit of slow stitching with you tonight on my Roxy Journal of Stitchery down the garden par piece so I actually started to do a video last night but for whatever reason I don't know if it was the gusty crazy windy weather um, not sure what it was but I was feeling very unsettled and I tried about four or five times and then I got to the point where I couldn't remember what I had or hadn't said to you and so I just gave up and deleted the video but before I finish this piece I want to at least show you what I'm doing on it and maybe do a bit of stitching with you and I'm also feeling the need for a bit of calming stitching tonight as well after a bit of news that we had this afternoon but I'll get to that later so this is the prompt piece for flower pots. So I've kind of gone a bit beyond the prompt, created my own little scene of what I wanted to create, which is a garden show with a crinoline lady, a glistening path, three pots um, with flowers in them, and then three pots as little sort of paintings or poss possibly tapestries on the wall of prize winning um, pot plants from previous garden shows in this pavilion called Gardenia which was from a selvage from a piece of fabric and then I've created my pavilion using um, upholstery samples and some material from the reverse art truck and then I've got this lovely piece of patchwork fabric from the Sewingly online op shop as my background and I've incorporated some of the beautiful antique floral flowers that I picked up in the op shop in Myrtleford on our recent holiday. And I've used two wooden buttons with little um, painted floral motifs on them as the little sides for my garden show banner. So I've still got a stitch down this one and I'm, we'll, we'll come back to that. So I'll just move it off the piece so I can hold the piece up. So. Starting from the top, this was the, the background, was the first piece I stitched down onto my base fabric. And then the second bit I stitched down was the bottom section of the flower. And with both those sections, I overlapped the fabric um, over the side of my base fabric so that I wouldn't have raw edges at the side. So you can see that there. And I just did a invisible stitch where you do a long stitch on the back and just pop up so you can't even see it, hence why it's called invisible stitch, just to um, hold those folded places in part and in, in place. Um, and then after I'd done the top background and the bottom, I then sewed down this middle section and folded those um, ends under as well and stitched those down. And then I did my structure pieces and I left the top of the structure unstitched so that I could then um, slip in my roof and slip in my little um, gardenia and then stitch that all down. And I've added these two beautiful vintage buttons from my Nana's button collection. So I'll just turn it over so you can see there's lots of um, invisible stitching holding everything down in all, all places as well as a needle, a working needle. Um, and then you can also see where I've done my stitching, um, which is actually visible stitching on the other side to do that. And then around the pot, I've done some stitches first of all to hold it down and then I've done a whole lot of little stitches over the edge because that's a raw edge and I want to make sure that that won't fray. I'm just looking out my window and it's the most beautiful sky. There's um, the sunlight illuminating um, quite a cloudy sky and the whole sky and clouds are just lit up with this golden orangey glow. I do like this particular craft desk which is also in my work from home office and it's just the most beautiful view out to the out to the horizon. It does have a house in the way but I can see sky which is most important. Um, and then I have stitched, oh, one of the things that I discovered and I'm always keen to um, share the little tips and tricks for what to do when things might not go quite to plan. When I stitched down the um, pavilion, I did it slightly skew if so it's slightly on a bit of an angle and it just kept um, appearing to my eye and I just kept looking at it going, oh, that's a little bit, that's a bit dodgy. Now I had this ribbon that I used on my chateau piece for one of the garden beds. Now it's a thicker 
piece of ribbon. Let me see if I can find another scrap of it that shows its thickness. Just going into my my scrap jar. Um, so it's normally this this thickness. And I had a spare piece that I'd cut thinner to use in the chateau uh, slow stitch piece, which I've got a video of. And I laid that along the base of the pavilion. And then what I did was just do three little long stitches to create little tufts of grass over the top of it. So it gives the impression of there being um, grass all the way along. And with my crinoline lady, I stitched her down um, towards the end but left um, her dress unstitched so that I could then slip the path under her and with the path I have folded it over. This is a piece of beautiful beading that my partner's mum gave to me and so I wanted to incorporate it in, in a piece um, that I'm going to keep. So it's been really nice. Even though it's probably a little bit over the top, I figure this is a fancy garden show and so it is A-OK. -okay. And so for the banner, I use, I cut out, and we did this last time, had a cut out piece of fabric. I used the reverse side because I wanted it in that more pale tone. And then I've just done back stitch, um, which is you basically do a stitch forward and then you bring another stitch back towards it to get a constant um, line of stitching. And it's great for doing sort of outlines or doing words. So I've got 2023 garden show and then I've got those cute little buttons there. And on my piece of fabric, again, because it was a raw edge, I just did a whole lot of little stitches over the side all the way around. And that's had the bonus of just giving it a bit of extra um, structure so that it sits really um, nicely out from the piece. So I didn't want to attach that to the, the background. I want it to kind of be fluttering in the, or hang, hanging in the breeze. So I really love adding yeah, textures to pieces so that they're not just all flat to the page. And that's where it was lovely to use these very vintage flowers that came from the Myrtleford op shop. And in fact, I had to do quite a bit of reconstruction work last night because some of them were starting to come off their little centers. This one had lost its little center. So I've done three little knots in the center in a matching color to the other ones. And then these were so crinkled up. What I've done as part of the stitching is stitch some of them um, down so that they actually sit a bit more flat rather than just being a big, big bundle of those. Now for, and this is probably what we can do next up, for these pictures on the wall, they're quite bright fabric, which is lovely, but I thought they were clashing a little bit with the, the tone of this piece, which is more pastels. So I came to a solution of using a very fine tulle to put over the top, and it gives almost the lovely effect of a sort of a tapestry effect to them. So it tones them down a bit, but also gives a nice little um, yeah, interesting feature on the top of them. Now the tulle that I used was actually from a piece of embroidered and decorated tulle. And so I just cut out some of the middle sections between where the flowers are and the flowers are something that I'll no doubt use in one of my, my other pieces. So that's just a little trick to kind of tone things down or just add another nice textural feature to it. So I think I've showed you enough at the macro scale, so I might bring you down and hopefully not make you seasick and hopefully not drop the camera. That happened last night too. That's when I think I eventually just sort of gave, gave up entirely. Um, so actually we might, do, we might do the pot first because I've got the needle threaded and was actually starting to do that when I switched the camera on. So with these little pots as well, as I mentioned, they are raw edge. So I'm wanting to, first of all, just tack them down and then I want to go around the full edge of them with little over stitches to um, make sure that they stay secure. So with the tacking, I'm just putting some stitches, um, invisible stitches around the pot to sort of hold it in place first. What you'll see with this first pot is I've actually not stitched it down in the, the middle. So I can actually put my finger partially in there because I want it to look like the pot is a bit rounded, it's a bit sort of concave. So I'm going to do the same on this one and just put the stitches around the outside. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. So 
So I mentioned at the start of this video that we had some news this afternoon. My partner went in for his heart stress test and there was a bit of me that was thinking as he as he went off for it. I was like, no, it's all gonna it's all gonna be fine. It's all gonna be fine. But I think I kind of had a bit of a feeling that it might not be, and I think maybe that is why I was just having such a restless feeling last night, and I just I just couldn't kind of settle, and everything was going <laughs> everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. I ended up gashing my finger on a needle that I'd left in a a bag of stitching from the weekend, and spilt my um, drink all over the bench and knocked my iPad down, knocked my phone out of the carrier. So it was a, it was a disastrous night last night. Anyway, um, so Alex went for his heart stress test this afternoon and when he came home, he goes, yeah, it's not, not good news. Um, and at first I actually thought he was maybe kind of just joking or just winding me up because my dad used to do that. He'd come back from the doctor and go, well, the leg's got to come off. Um, which it didn't have to come off. Wouldn't be that funny if it did actually have to come off, but yeah, Dad used to kind of do that sort of joking. So for a moment, for just an instant, I thought, oh, he's just, just having a bit of a lend of me. Anyway, it turns out, no, it really, um, it wasn't good news. And he's now got an urgent referral to see a cardiologist at Cabrini um, where he had the tests done um, tomorrow. So we'll be heading off there tomorrow morning um, to find out what's going to happen because as part of the stress test where they I think get you running on um, on a treadmill he was fine when he was at rest but when he started to go at a much more rapid pace he um, had his heart was just spiking so as far as Alex knows from what they told him, the testing sort of staff and the doctor there told him he's got an electrical issue with his heart. So we don't know exactly what that means. Of course, we've um, done the wrong thing of um, looking up Dr. Google. Um, I just had to do that because I was like, hmm, electrical signal, what does that actually mean? I, I figured I probably had a bit of an idea because my Nana had a pacemaker um, so I'm aware that that's, that's definitely an electrical issue that, yeah, that she had in her heart. Um, and so, yeah, that's one of the, I guess that's one of the possible solutions for electrical issues. But looking online, there's a range of different scenarios, um, including, I think there can be tablets that they can, they can give, um, pacemaker or other sorts of, sorts of interventions. So I guess we'll, we will find out more tomorrow um, I'll be going to that appointment because I do want to um, I want to hear directly what's what's said um, so we'll drop Travis off at my parents for a little a little visit with Lucy the dog um, but yeah there was a bit of me that was just hoping on oh, maybe it's just a strain like we we thought it might be because obviously he's um, yeah when he came out from the emergency department we knew he had to go and do the do the stress test, and that's so why that's why he's gone and done it. But I was hopeful that maybe maybe he was going to get his clean bill of health today, and would be able to then just sort of um, move forward with working out whether it was something muscular in his in his chest or. But anyway, it's always I think always better to know, and I'm not going to get myself into a stress over it. We have the appointment tomorrow. It's great to have something so soon, um, but I think it is an indication of the seriousness of it um, because he said the yeah the clinician or the doctor went sort of straight out after that had happened on his on his um, stress test and then came straight back in and said yeah no you'll be coming in back in tomorrow morning so Alex has packed his little bag in case he um, has to has to get admitted in um, and we'll just yeah we'll take it take it from there um, but at least we have answers, so that's a that's a positive thing. Um, so doing okay, but I thought I would come on. I will stitch. I will talk to you. If I talk to you, then it will help me to just sort of process and go. Yep, that's what's happening. Um, and who knows? We might be lucky if it was actually a strain that sort of kicked this all off, and it's helped to um, identify an issue that's actually at play. 
and Alex can get it get it fixed and that's a really that's a good thing that's a good outcome so I hope I'm still on camera yes I'm still on camera I think am I in focus am I up the right way I think I am so we'll see how we go otherwise it'll just be another deleted video and I will have had a chat to you but no one no one will have heard it um so yeah that's that's the Alex state of play we were actually having a, a laugh at dinner time because Alex has this way when we go on holidays he always on the way home he's like oh, I really wish we had have done another week another um, two weeks when we used to go to Europe and go for a couple of months he'd be like oh I wish we had have gone for another month and it's like yep yep we all do all do anyway when we came back from Japan and it was now three three years ago yeah three years ago in um, February yeah I think it's three years Alex as we were traveling home said oh, I really really don't want to go back to work really wish I um, could stay away from work for longer anyway just as we left Japan they were going into lockdown with the COVID pandemic just at its very early early days um, so the island that we were leaving Hokkaido was going into lockdown um, Australia was a little bit a ways behind Italy had already had um, yeah the major major outbreaks obviously China um, at the in the very early days as well but Australia was still sort of I guess um, yeah a bit a bit behind in its preparing for and um, taking action on but interestingly on the day that Alex was due to go back to work after we'd um, got home I'd already gone off to work I'd gone for my my morning swim I used to do a swim on the way to way to work um, I'd get up at 5 25 and be in the pool and then out of the pool and off to work after that anyway Alex um, phoned in to work and his colleague or his boss said oh no you can't come in you've just come back from come back from a country that's um yeah got going into lockdown or got pan, um COVID issues no you'll have to have to stay home so he did that for that day and then within either the next day or the day after his work went to full remote working everyone was sent home and sent home to work my work interestingly took a bit bit longer um to actually get prepared but it was interesting because i came back from japan and having watched um japan go into lockdown and seen obviously yeah workers being sent to work from home i immediately um in the week that i got back i said oh I said to my exec team we're really going to have to think about what we um our preparedness for if we suddenly have to dispatch all our workers to to work from home and they all looked at me a bit like i was being a bit of a um <laughs> a sort of a not a rumor monger a sort of bearer of um not necessarily sort of accurate but just bearer of doom doomsday <laughs> sort of things and i said no I, I think we need to look at it i'll just i'll just do a few things on that the side to get our preparedness in in place anyway within a within a week our entire workforce was remote working and thankfully I'd put in place um, the arrangements so that everyone had I mean we all had laptops anyway um, but just made sure we had enough um, of the IT supplies extra battery packs um, had sufficient screens that we were able to dis uh, dispatch um, extra screens home to workers um, we had the logistics to get people's um, chairs and other things to them so that they could do safe working, working from home. So that was one of those times when having that little bit of international perspective and that little bit of um, preparedness definitely, definitely helped. So with the top of the pot, and hopefully I'm still on camera, I'm just going to, as I say, not stitch it down. I'm just going to do these little over stitches. Um, just over the edge and leave the top unstitched down so that it gives that sense of a pot that's actually that's actually open at the top and so yeah that was that was Japan and then we ended up with a three-year pandemic where Alex has not gone back to work apart from on a few occasions where he's had to go in and um, do particular things in there um, 
in their telecommunication sort of lab where he has to sometimes do things in their model, whatever that means, the telecommunications <laughs> model. But it's been pretty rare that he's actually gone back to work. And so his whole his whole wish when we're returning from holidays is I don't don't feel like going back into work. Has kind of happened over that that three year period and um, yeah, and it's not a regular thing now that he is even in the office anyway. Obviously at the moment he's off off on sick leave. Um, but yeah, when we came back from, from Bright, he's like, oh, really could do with a, a few, more, few more weeks off work anyway. That, from that Monday when we ended up in emergency with um, chest pains to, to now, he hasn't, hasn't been even working. He's not even been yeah, logging on because obviously we need to work out what's going on. And now we know that there is a definite um, yeah, a heart stress issue at play and a risk factor that his medical team are concerned about. So he sent a message off to his boss tonight. I might just take this pin out so it doesn't end up stabbing me. Um, and yeah, I'll give his boss an update tomorrow if he ends up needing to be admitted or something like that. But hopefully, yeah, who knows? I'm not gonna think, not gonna plan the worst, but we'll be prepared if he does need to, does need to go in. Trav and I can, can batch it alone at home. Okay. But I think slow stitching will be my little my little sanity. But interestingly I'm not feeling um not feeling the way I did last night, which was just, I felt all, all discombobulated is the word, that nice big word. I do love that word, discombobulated, but I definitely felt that yesterday. Today, I'm just like, yep, we can, we can take this in our stride. We got this one. So I'm just using some regular cotton. I got a whole lot of cottons from Alex's mum as well, which I've just sorted into little containers by sort of colour colour grouping. And I figured I'll um, use them. So they're vintage cottons from her collection that she doesn't use anymore. But I figure they're a great one to use just for these little um, minor stitching projects when you don't necessarily want the thread to be the the major feature. Obviously, I used the embroidery thread for the more um, yeah, the more significant pieces. I actually used a variegated green thread for that sign up the top, not that you can see that much graduation in, in colour. You can see a little, little colour wash as it goes along. And I'm thinking we'll use that variegated thread for our third pot where we're going to be using buttons as our little flowers and, post and probably do some additional stitching. And I can consider adding some other stitching to our other pots as well if I think it needs it. And then I'll probably finish the piece with some seed stitches down the bottom to hold that piece nicely, make that all cohesive. And then I might do some little um, running stitches along the patchwork to almost make it look even more patchworky. But I'll have a think about that. pot stitched down probably not the most exciting thing watching watching me stitch pots but otherwise I would have probably ended up finishing it because there's not there's not that much exciting stitching in this piece it's just really combining all the all the lovely elements together that makes makes the piece oops I need to actually take that I know what I'm doing I was about to cut that off on the wrong side always take your take your thread to the other side before you tie it off and stitch it out. So happy International Women's Day. Um, I should have said that up front to all the lovely 
women who I know through YouTube and the lovely subscribers and watchers as well. I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful day. I think the one thing we can do is, as women is um, yeah, lift each other up and support each other and champion all the awesomeness. And there are just so many awesome, awesome stitches. Okay, what am I doing? Getting carried away with my go women, go women. We are awesome. Okay, so this last pot, as I mentioned, I'm going to do some um, embroidery and then use some of my buttons um, to create some some flowers. And it's actually really nice. I didn't I didn't actually plan it this way, but there's um, flowers on the piece of patchwork behind that as well. Lots of flowers everywhere. Some people might think it's a bit clashy, like different different flowers, but I kind of like that, and I like the spots and. But I like that the structure's that more sort of classic, classic look. That works for me. Let's get rid of the pin. Okay. Pot number three. And then we will come back and do the other picture. Now we're going for time. That's okay. Before I came on I was just starting to watch the lovely Corinne at To Be Loved Treasures by Corinne with her part 48 wave of colour. Wow. So I think we'll be seeing her put a swing and a beehive on that piece which will be great. So shout out to Corinne as one of the lovely lovely YouTubers. She is just a uh, a power horse of um, of stitching. She's amazing how much stitching she gets done across all her all her different pieces. One piece is well and truly enough for me. I suppose I am doing rather rather large sized pieces, but yeah, definitely definitely don't have capacity for for more than one. Don't think I'll have wall space either by the time I've added all these all these pieces together. I might have to build another story so that I'll have a big enough staircase to, to hang it down. So I right, will work it out at the end. I can always frame them up as sort of individual pieces or hang them as individual pieces. There's lots of options. They're probably too big to turn into a book, I think. So I think that option is probably off the table. they can always still be rolled up as a scroll but I've probably got some quite delicate items in there now like the like the flowers that I want to treat pretty pretty carefully So I'm just doing those stitches first of all just to hold my pot in place and then we'll come back and do the, the stitching around. So I'm glad we had our little little beach trip to Inverloch on the weekend. At least we got some nice sunshine because now they're saying the Arctic blast is on its way to us, or is possibly with us, although it didn't get that, that cold. It's definitely like long, long pants and long sleeve top weather, but it's not, not blisteringly cold. I think it's only going to get down to 11 or something tonight. So hopefully that means the tomatoes in my, my veggie patch continue to ripen because I've got so many green tomatoes just waiting for that sort of last bit of ripening weather. If not, um, I'll be hitting you up for recipes using green tomatoes. I think it's quite a, an American thing, isn't it, to um, have fried green tomatoes. I've actually never done fried green tomatoes, so I'll have to, I'll have to give that recipe a go. And I think you can make chutneys and other things with them. But there's nothing better than ripe, ripe tomatoes in the in summer. 
Just love that. Again, a little tip would be don't put beaded sections on until you've done all your stitching because your thread can get can get caught on it. Um, or on your um, crinoline lady if she's not stitched down like that one. So I might just move my piece around. That's the other tip. If you are getting caught, try and find a way to have your piece sitting so that it doesn't um, the thread hangs where you want it to want it to hang. I hope I haven't got the camera too close. It's always a bit of a compromise between too far away and you can't see anything or too close and it gets a bit hard to see as well. I'm just um, do using these little over stitches to hold the raw edges in place and make sure they, if they are fraying at all, that they don't sort of fray any anymore. Like there's one little thread that you can see just poking up, but I'm just going to stitch that down and hold it in place and create a knot with my thread, it seems. Okay, let's see. I think we've got rid of our knot, have we? Yes. Okay, let's go around this way. Just try and catch it just onto this piece of fabric here. Then I'm not having to come all the way through from the back and I can probably pull this down a smidge. So again, these pop fabrics were from the reverse uh, art truck which is in nearby Listerfield, no, not Listerfield Park, Hural Park. Um, it's in a big shed there, and they collect up fabric samples from all sorts of businesses around the place and have massive racks and, and bins filled with, um, yeah, fabric samples to, to look through and select what you want. And I actually got a lovely extra little haul of those on the, the weekend. I think I mentioned it in my other video that I popped down to take Travis for a walk at the park and realised that the um, the reverse art truck was open so I, I popped in because they let dogs come in and Travis was so well behaved just sat next to me while I looked through all the fabrics and then I got him a, a bonus um, toy as well. They have some really heavy duty um, cardboard tubes like really quite thick um, that Travis, even with his teeth, he's only made um, some little little indentations in that. So he was very happy with his, his new play toy. Just goes to prove you can spend a lot of money on a, a dog toy and then they're just as happy playing with a, a cardboard tube. In fact, I think he was more excited about that than the presents we'd bought for him from the, the pet shop on his, um, on his actual birthday. He brings the, the cardboard tube upstairs and sits with it outside outside my room when I'm working. Even though the door is open and he could come in when I'm on, on meetings or on calls, he just sits out there, has a little rest, and then he waits till he hears me say, bye, take care everyone, and then he comes comes in. He knows that exact, <laughs> exact phrase. It is so funny. He's such a smart little boy. Alex and I really can't have a, a chat conversation about anything that's got any words at all that he knows, and he knows a lot of words because he will listen there and he will get excited if it's something that's exciting to him. So we've got to be very careful the conversations we have. But I explained to him at um, dinner time tonight, I explained to him that we'll be dropping him off to Nana and Grandpa's tomorrow and with Lucy the dog. And then it'll be having a little a little stay, a stay and a play. But I think he'll be pretty happy because Grandpa will usually take him and Lucy for a walk and he loves the the park they've got behind their house, a beautiful, beautiful big park. Lots of lovely lush grass and, and gardens, a big oval that all the dogs can play off lead on. Um, it was where we grew up, so my parents are still in the house where we where we grew up and yeah, my brother and I would spend our summers just in the park. Mum would literally probably let us out at, at um, breakfast time and then we'd come back for a, 
a brief lunch and then we would be off again um, into the park climbing trees and building cubby houses my brother and I are only 18 months apart in age so we were pretty pretty close growing up um, he now lives in West Western Australia so um, we don't get to see each other and we haven't seen each other during the whole COVID time so they're the ones that are going to be coming over at Easter with my little or not so little now um, two nephews and niece so it's going to be just so amazing to see them because they've all grown up so much I guess that's what a pandemic and no travel will do um, because they used to come over every second Christmas and then we'd be over there and go and yeah rent a house and go and stay near them and spend some really good time with them but we just haven't haven't been able to do that so and my brother's not a big one for talking on phones and I'm actually not a big one for talking on phones either um, but yeah kind of when we're around each other it's just like you pick up where you where you left off as as brother and sister so some good natured jibing and nicknames for each other but yeah, it'll be lovely and uh, my sister-in-law is amazing. My brothers are flying in a fly and fly out role and so my sister-in-law looks after and raises the, the three kids when Rob's away and I am just in absolute awe of her. So a big shout out to her on this International Women's Day too. She is an awesome, awesome mum. So yeah, shout out to all of you that are, are raising kids or caring for kids. There's a lot of people in caring roles as well and the grandparents out there that do a lot too. And also to all the, all the puppy mamas too. You do a lot. We had a really interesting panel at our work today discussing um, yeah, International Women's Day and just experiences of people within our our, our organisation. It was just really, really inspiring. And really thought-provoking too. There's so many, I guess, lenses that we can apply to the, the biases or the barriers or the opportunities that, that face people and, and the sort of factors that change as well. So issues like disability, um, issues about cultural cultural background, um, assumptions people make. Um, one of the panellists was talking about, um, her brother told her about a, a term, um, rather than just the glass ceiling, um, it's also called the rice ceiling and it's about the barriers that people from Asian backgrounds face in, in some workplaces um, in terms of advancement and opportunities and assumptions and things. Um, she was saying that it's amazing the number of times that people have said to her, oh, you must love eating rice. And she's like, well, actually, no, I don't, I don't particularly <laughs> like rice. Um, and yeah, obviously, when you've got a cultural background, it's not nice when people make assumptions or even make assumptions about what your cultural background might be. So it's always good to reflect on the assumptions we make and the biases that we all, the unconscious biases that we all have towards people as well. It's probably interesting like with these videos on, on YouTube, what are the assumptions we make when we're just seeing a set of hands or um, hearing a voice? Um, yeah, a really, really interesting topic. And in my organisation, we're quite a uh, we're a big organisation and um, quite a diverse one as well. So I'm within the, the government um, sector um, and we have a whole range of emergency roles as well, which tend to be very male dominated areas of work. Um, and so there's a whole range of challenges and issues. And one of the panellists was just saying, even with everything they're doing to make sure that the um, yeah, the workplaces in those emergency response roles are um, considering what needs to be changed to make them welcoming places for women. It's still incredibly hard to retain women in those in those roles. And then it's almost a bit of a self-reinforcing circle because, um, as some of the panellists said, when they started out in those emergency 
response roles. They'd look around the room and there'd be no other women that they could kind of look to and, and think, okay, that's someone that I could approach to be my mentor or my, my coach. So you need to kind of have that critical mass to create an environment that is actually, is actually welcoming. Same issue in workplaces, um, for example, with um, Aboriginal people or traditional owners. Um, and if you don't have an environment where there are other people um, that are Aboriginal or Indigenous or Torres Strait Islander and um, people don't have that sort of, yeah, support network around them, it's not always going to be a culturally sort of safe place for them them to be. So there's lots of, yeah, lots of really significant issues to work through in workplaces to make sure that they're places that are going to be supportive to people from diverse backgrounds. And particularly within a government area, we need to be making sure that our, our um, workforce reflects the community we serve, which is a diverse one. So anyway, that's enough about work. But yeah, I just thought that was a really inspiring um, inspiring discussion and thought-provoking, so I thought I would share some of that with you. I was also speaking of inspiring, um, watching Sarah Homfrey do a video, a video on samplers through the ages the other day, so the, sort of the tradition of samplers um, at different points in, in history. So that's, um, I think she's just under Sarah Hom. Actually, let me just have a look in my subscriptions. I'll get you her proper name. And I'm just scrolling on my iPad. I bet I won't be able to find it now. Can I find it, please? No, nope, I'm scrolling, I'm not seeing it. They don't put them in alphabetical order, do they? There she is. Um, Sarah Homfrey, H-O-M-F-R-A-Y. And it was a video that I think is just from 11 days ago, History of Samplers, Books, Online Resources and Some Examples. And so the example one that she shared was this amazing sampler that one of her viewers, subscribers, from Ukraine is making as she is living through um, the war in Ukraine and she's making a sampler focused on the sort of traditions of Ukraine but also focused on her wishes and hopes for peace. So I thought that was just just incredible and the sampler is just absolutely gorgeous. So let's just check, I think I'm still on film but I will need to probably move down a smidgeroo. Just want to get the first stitch in on this piece. Hopefully it's in the right place. And then we can mosey on down. So I've got the um, chill over the top of the picture and I've lined it up as best as I can. Probably not totally straight, but that's fine. We're slow stitching and so it doesn't actually, doesn't actually. Perfection is not what we're seeking here. We're just seeking to get it stitched down. Have a go. And if it looks a bit rustic, well, that's good because that's what we're doing. Now I do just need to keep my chill piece and my background piece together as much as possible. Oops. It's always harder when you're doing it on camera because you've got to kind of hold it in the right spot and then you've still got to actually get it, get it stitching. Okay, so I'll just do a little stitch up to the pot. I'm not stitching over the sort of design, so I'll then just bring the stitch behind in the, the fabric and stitch it here. But yeah, I like the effect of the, the chul on top. Um, because it gives almost looks like a little a little tapestry or something. 
and with my outlining colors I'm using alternating ones that match with um, some of the other other pieces so I've got the yellow the yellowy green from that piece and then the brown over there and then the white over here so I do like just thinking of those little elements of um, yeah there's a bit of thought that goes into things might look all random but there is there is thought Oops, I've just caught that corner up. Can I uncatch it? Yes, I can. So shout out to some of the other amazing women on YouTube. I'm going to give a shout out to Elizabeth Robinson, who does beautiful videos of the Down the Garden Path. path. Does great tutorials on things. She did a tutorial on cauliflowers, which is very cool. Fabric cauliflowers you're using sari silk. Who else am I gonna shout out? And then there's one it's J-U-A-N-E-T-T-E-S, the apostrophe S, Crafting Corner. I can't remember exactly how it's pronounced. I think it's, yeah, Juanetti, Juanetti. It's not pronounced with the J, so apologies if I'm not getting that quite quite spot on, but you'll find her if you, if you search on that. That is a bit, I've made that a little bit wonky. It's sitting up a little, a little bit too far, but will that be a problem? Probably. It's a bit wonky. Okay. It is a bit too, too wonky. It's going to bother me if I don't un unpick those stitches. So, but we might leave that to do until after. Now it's going to be really hard to un unpick, isn't it? Through that mesh. We'll go from the back. Maybe I shouldn't have been so busy shouting out. Maybe I should have been focusing on where I was putting, putting my piece. Yes, and yes, is the starting piece okay? No, I think we started too far up anyway. Imperfection is okay, but when it looks totally, totally wrong, it's probably, probably not okay. I actually think I probably need to sit this down, down a smidgey, smidgeroo. And I might actually just use one of my little pins to, to pin it in place. Okay, we'll give it a take two. Once we get going, and if it's right, it shouldn't shouldn't take us too long. How are we going for time? Okay, let's get this done. Let's go. Okay, I might do that side first. Seeing I've popped up there. Actually, I'll just put that stitch in and then I'll come down here. Oops. Let's go. It is amazing how long this this stitching caper. When you're just doing it yourself, you don't notice, but when you pop the timer on in the video, you're like, wow. It does take a while for even things that look quite simple. And that little bit of sort of unpicking things when yeah, something's not quite right. 
and I think it's just that yeah that extra degree of difficulty of being on camera and um, just wanting to make sure that you're on screen and holding it in the right place means your stitches aren't quite as natural or easy as they might be if you're sitting just in your comfortable spot with your pillow or sitting it resting it against the bench but it's worth it so nice having a chat with you all another shout out for a wonderful youtuber who i really admire their work and just love their peaceful calming videos um, leanne's crafty cupboard again she's doing roxy's journal of stitchery as well take the pin out before we stab ourselves and leanne um, adds lovely little views of her her garden at home. She also did a lovely view in one of her videos of this beautiful garden that she'd um, that her husband had taken her to to visit. And she also tells funny stories about her dog and the the Mr. Whippy van. That was a special special for me because I'd mentioned Mr. Whippy vans in passing. That was a very bodgy. Very bodgy stitch to steal one of Rachel's terms. Very bodgy indeed. And then there's Mimi from no, Marnell from Mimi's Treasures. I knew I got that wrong. She does a lot of journals, but she's also taking part in this, this project as well. She just she recently shared a, a video on the name of her, yeah, of her sort of channel and how that came about through um, her grandmother's name um, was Mimi. And she had shared this beautiful um, leather little portfolio, little sort of fold, foldy outy place where her grandma kept all of her treasures, her photos and other things that she she treasured. So that's how the name of her channel came about. My channel name's pretty straightforward, being um, Create and Craft with Christine, kind of self-explanatory. It's sometimes hard on YouTube. You see people's channel names, but you don't know if that's their actual um, their actual name themselves. Okay, I'm happy with that. We're going to call that that little frame done and sorted. So we'll tie that off at the back, and let's get on to our flower pot. So I'm going to use this. So I'm going to get rid of that piece of thread into my little thread place and I'm going to use, oops, nope, thread stuck to my finger and I'm going to use this variegated green thread to do our little pots and so I thought I might do a fly stitch maybe to create some little branches that the buttons can then go on so I thought I might do a little background let's have a look or we could just do it with a running stitch as well all of it relies on actually getting a needle threaded let's see if I can actually get this get this threaded now it is pitch black outside I've still got the blinds open so if anyone's walking by on the street they'll see my my lights lights blazing and they'll probably wonder what on earth I'm doing talking away in my room to myself in fact our neighbor um, immediately next door she was out um, working on her lawn this is a good number of weeks ago now um, and she said oh, what is it that you do do in your room at night she said I've seen seen the lights and I said oh slow stitching um, 
she goes, oh, what's, what's that? So I kind of told her about it and she said, oh, well, I do. I write books, children's books. Um, so it's great. It's great how many different, um, yeah, different activities people and creative pursuits that people do. So I'm going to create Little Wise, I think. So I think this, this is called Fly Stitch. I always get confused between these ones. Anyway, you'll kind of see the, the stitch in action. So it's basically making a Y shape. And then I create some more Ys. I don't know exactly what sort of plant I'm trying to make here, but just doing, just doing something, something that will please me. It's just a quick way to get some little branchy shapes, really. Hopefully, maybe I'll just better move it up a bit, make sure I'm actually on, on camera. Oops. Wasn't too much Y in that one, but that's okay. Oops, thread's just whipping around. There's another Y, bring it down to here. But as I say, you could also do this just with a, a running stitch. It's just this happens to be a quicker way sometimes to, to get all the branches done in sort of single, single motions. Oops, just need to catch that bit of thread. I do. Yeah, I'll do one more. One more set. And I can take this one down into the pot so that there isn't a gap showing. Let's take the thread quite a ways down into the pot and that's where it helps having the top this pot o pot open as well okay and then we can just actually I probably should just come up the, the back of the fabric rather than having the thread all the I'll take myself up there and then let's put this one a bit higher up I think That was very, that was quite a long one. I think that's a bit too far actually. Oops, catching on everything. So let's just, let's just make that a little bit less, I think. Still got my squeaky chair. I haven't, haven't tried that great tip that I got yet of some a spray of vegetable oil because I can't stand the smell of WD-40. I did actually try spraying another little um, essential oil I had. I thought maybe that would work, but obviously not. Or maybe it needs a bit more. Or maybe I just didn't get the right spot. All these possibilities and more. I can see the variegation in the thread now. It's got those sort of lighter, lighter spots there. I was wondering if we were getting much, much variation in the variegation. Oops, from the other side. Just reversing the order that I'm popping up in. So what's happening in your life? I hope you're doing well. Hope you're not having any 
medical concerns. I know a few of my subscribers have had to have operations and other things this year, so sending big love out to you as well. Some of you haven't been able to be here yeah, using your, your hands, which must be so frustrating if you're a keen a keen stitcher, but hopefully you can you can stitch vicariously through those of us that um, are doing these projects. One of my gardening buddies, so uh, an Instagram, sort of someone I met through through Instagram here in Melbourne, um, a girl called Poppy, and it's her dad sort of, yeah, posts her Instagram, but she she was an amazing gardener, grew all these sunflowers and tomato plants. Um, you just used her front yard, actually, to, to do all this amazing growing. Um, but today they posted a picture, actually, of... Um, Poppy's mum in a hospital bed um, with Poppy there and it turns out that um, she's had um, two brain surgeries in the last week for an issue that yeah she knew for a while something apparently wasn't wasn't right and just kept sort of getting it investigated and it turned out that she had um, a brain tumour which is just horrifying someone pretty young like I think younger than younger than me um, with a young family so I absolutely yeah send my very very best thoughts their way to Poppy and Chad and and Poppy's mama it's just shocking when you kind of yeah have those things and I guess we've got our own little um, health emergency well not emergency health health issues here to, to work through you kind of go from everything being fine one day to yeah, something, something not being fine. But we're so lucky we have have the healthcare. Lucky we didn't live back in the the dark ages. I was even reflecting on that um, earlier. No, last year now actually, um, when I got an abscess in my sinus at the base of a tooth, and ended up having to go through the whole root canal process and and all of that which isn't isn't fun but it wasn't painful at any stage for me and um got the problem addressed it was many hours in the chair it was uncomfortable definitely having your mouth open for that long but it wasn't wasn't painful but I was reflecting that in the middle ages or right up until sort of more recent history you would have basically died of the infection not a very happy thought but we have to be absolutely grateful for the the medical advances that we have because yeah one they didn't have antibiotics and things but with a with an abscess of that type it will eventually spread into the surrounding tissues and teeth and jaw and the rest of the sinus and everywhere else and eventually that infection will will get out of control and do away with you and probably in a fair bit of pain as well so very lucky I was born when I was and that I am living where, where I'm living. And likewise for Alex being able to get good immediate immediate care. Being able to get in and see the yeah, the cardiologist straight away, obviously with the with the hospital's referral. So probably would have taken a lot longer if it was just trying to get a sort of a referral through the, the doctor. So it's really fortunate that um, yeah, that he took his pains seriously and took his spiking blood pressure and other things really seriously and just knew within himself that there was something something not quite right. So that's the that's the message from this one, even from the our friend um, who's in hospital after the the two brain tumor operations. Always listen to your gut. If you think something's not right, um, get a first opinion, get a second opinion. Yeah, investigate we know our body's best we know when we're not feeling the way that we think we should be feeling so yeah I'm really happy with how this um, Y stitch is working out I do hope I'm on on camera So 
get a few more done and then we can get some buttons on. I might not put as many buttons as I had in my mock-up because it does look a little bit over the top. So I might try and be a bit restrained. Do you reckon I can be restrained if I put my mind to it? Avoid having a loose thread at the back that might catch. Oops, the thread came out. That's all right. Oops. Uh, so this Wednesday we'll just be seeing the progress, won't we, on um, Rachel and... Sarah's pieces. I was thinking, oh, do we get a new prompt? No, not for a, not for another week, which is probably good because I've got still things I can do on this one. I need to go back to my chateau piece and finish just um, finish the stitches on those. I thought I might use it for some of these subsequent prompts, but nothing so far. And I think I'll probably just yeah finish it off because I've got enough other. I can just create new pieces when I need to add a new prompt just like this one even though it was a smallish prompt of um, pots I went to town on it and that's fine as well it's all about having fun follow your gut follow your gut with stitching follow the, your gut with your health there is no no right or wrong what you want to do and that's the same when you think when something's bothering you about your piece you either go hey can I fix it in its current form like I was able to do with the grass down the bottom or before with the picture where I was just like ah oh, that's just that's just crooked and not not in alignment and you just you fix it by taking it out if that's what you need to do to make yourself happy with your piece there's no point having something that that bothers you Great thing with slow stitch though is it's easy to cover up or unpick or whatever it is that you you need to do. Okay, I reckon we need five, so I'm gonna just um, pop up the back again. Let's just pop up here. I am loving having this thicker fabric to, to work with because it just holds the pieces really nicely when I'm doing this sort of stitching. Otherwise I'd be constantly having to flatten it on my surface to make sure that it wasn't um, it wasn't puckering. It's great that the um, fabric has the sort of flowery background on it because it's creating a really nice little little backdrop to these le leafy leafy bits. Beyond my first piece, I haven't actually stitched that many um, flowers, so my wild flowers had quite a few embroidered um, over a sort of embroidered flowers on it. Some flowers using. Um, the bullion stitch or the worm stitch as some people call it. I think I prefer bullion. Worm stitch sounds a little bit a little bit revolting. Um, but my other pieces I haven't really done much of the stitching um, of flowers. So it's nice. It's very relaxing. I sometimes forget just how nice it is to just do a repetitive sort of stitch obviously running stitch very relaxing but even a stitch like this is nice to do where you don't have to worry about being a regular in fact where you want to be a irregular and hopefully I've got enough thread just to just to finish this one off hopefully let's just pop that down into the pot pop it out the back out the back and then let's just stitch it over and stitch and let's just do a second one okay got our two two knots there that'll be fine okay so that's our oops 
There we are. Hopefully you can see that. That's our beautiful little fly stitch, if indeed it is a fly stitch. And now we need to pick out our buttons that we want to add on. What are our favourite buttons? I did want to use this one from, but it does look kind of big. Where else could, maybe I end up putting, maybe I will put, put one of these maybe somewhere down there, I think, because I think it's too big for our, our flower. I think that one's nice. It's got the nice pale yellows on it. Oops. Don't need blue thread. That, that one's probably too big as well. Have another little white one. Could have a yellow. Or do I go more with the whites and clears? Maybe I'll use that white one there because it's a bit smaller. And then I've got a nice orangey one, orangey pinky, which is good. And what would be the final one that I want? that pink colour as well so I wonder if I maybe put that I suppose I can actually have them sitting a bit more up down up down or just sort of array them out a bit maybe this one is too big as well maybe we'll put that down I don't know if you can see the little cluster I've created down this corner maybe we'll do that Although five always does look better, so maybe I do need to fit this one, this one in. Yeah, maybe that'll do. So I think I probably better draw the video um, to a close there. I will just proceed to stitch down all um, those buttons. But there is um, my piece. So I'll, I might start at the, the top. And then, sorry for the creaking seat. And then all the way down to the bottom. So as I mentioned, I'll do some seed stitches here. And I'll probably do some little stitches across um, the background if I think it needs it. I'll stitch down my little cu cluster of um, pretty beads there. And I'll stitch those beads on to the plant. And I'll post a final picture at the end, I think, or a couple of pictures so you can see how it all looks. So thanks everyone for watching. Take care. Thanks for your best wishes for us. Thanks for thinking of us. And I'll let you know how we go. See you everyone.